Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, learn what environmentalists would like to see from state lawmakers this session. Also tonight, we'll hear about a unique way to fund art projects, and we'll take you to the Phoenix Zoo for a program that links teenagers with animals. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Today's opening day of Congress saw two members of Arizona's congressional delegation vote against their party leadership. Representative Paul Gosar joined 24 other Republicans in voting against John Boehner for Speaker of the House. Gosar was the only Republican from Arizona to do so. And Representative Kirsten Sinema was among only four House Democrats to vote against retaining Nancy Pelosi as minority leader. One more note from Capitol Hill, newly elected Representative Martha McSally has been appointed to lead a House panel on emergency preparedness and response. Clarence Carter is out as head of Arizona's Department of Economic Security. Carter submitted his resignation yesterday. Carter was at the helm when it was discovered that more than 6,000 child abuse and neglect complaints had gone uninvestigated by the department's Child Protective Services. Carter is the first agency director under former Governor Brewer to leave under new Governor Doug Ducey. And a quick sports note, former Diamondbacks pitcher Randy Johnson was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame today. Johnson's career includes five Cy Young Awards, over 300 wins, and the best strikeout rate in the history of the game. Hall of Fame induction ceremonies will take place this summer. The state legislature begins its new session next week, which gives us time this week to hear what advocates for a variety of issues are looking for from lawmakers this year. Now, last night we heard from the business community. Tonight, Sandy Barr, director of the Sierra Club's Grand Canyon chapter, tells us what environmentalists are hoping to see. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. It's nice to be here. So what do you, what do you want to see from lawmakers this go around regarding environmental issues? Well, first of all, what we always would like to see from them is for them to do no harm. Uh, one of the things that we have seen at the legislature over the last few years is a real attack on environmental protections, eroding protections that have been in place for, for a couple of decades. And so we would like to see them stop that and, uh, and really uh, think about uh, the importance of, of, of preventing problems instead of waiting down the road and having to clean up polluted water, for example, makes a lot more sense to have a strong uh, aquifer protection program that uh, keeps the pollution out of our groundwater. Uh, were there bills that failed last year uh, that you think will likely return? Yes, definitely. Uh, there were a number of, uh, of bills, uh, attacks on Mexican gray wolves trying to uh, uh, allow for uh, more killing of wolves, uh, fewer protections, uh, funding litigation against wolf recovery. I would expect to see uh, some of those back this year. Uh, every year we see uh, um, some bills that are, you know, thumbing, thumbing, the legislature thumbing its nose at the federal government. And so the, the wolf bills and endangered species bills definitely fit into that category. Uh, I would expect some uh, bills related to public lands, uh, uh, even though Arizonans strongly support our public lands and have sent a very strong message to the legislature uh, that they do not want the legislature in charge of them. I, I would expect the legislature to come back with measures aimed at trying to gain m more control of public lands. Using your example uh, of wolves here for a second, how do you balance wolf recovery with ranching interests? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's actually fairly easy, uh, um, but it, if you use the facts, um, it's fairly easy. Uh, wolves uh, uh, take uh, very few livestock. Uh, there is a coexistence plan in place to uh, help uh, ranchers avoid problems and to compensate them if there are problems. So it really, you know, it really is, is not the issue that they make it out to be, but um, there's just this irrational, um, really, uh, um, you know, dislike of, of, of wolves. And uh, some people in the legislature would like to see no wolves in Arizona. Uh, as well, when you talk about protecting land and water, how do you do that and also protect property rights, water rights, these sorts of things? How, how do you get that environmental issue in there, but also protect 
those rights? Well, protecting uh, the land, protecting the air, protecting the water, it's actually protecting our property rights because what you know, we don't want our neighbor polluting water that runs onto our property or um, dumping uh, something toxic. I mean, th these laws are in place and if they're properly implemented and enforced, they protect our rights and they also protect the rights of future generations, which is something that is often left out uh, we, you know, the governor, uh, 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 his first action was uh, to uh, implement a moratorium on rulemaking uh, related to regulation. And uh, to me, that's a, a foolish thing to do. It, we, we know it doesn't save money. And what it means is our laws are, are, are not going to be implemented the way they should be. They won't be updated. We won't have the kinds of protections in place that we need to protect our air, our water, and the land, and, and it's, it's, it's actually essential to protect our, our rights and also essential to our economy. Uh, anybody who uh, is paying attention knows that tourism is a big part of our economy, and uh, a lot of people come here to see places like Grand Canyon and Saguaro National Park, as well as our wonderful state parks, which is something else we would like to see from the legislature. Will you please step up and uh, find a, a, a sustainable funding source for these parks, and we don't mean privatization. Well, and, and that brings us now to the budget. When you talk about sustainable funding sources, funding sources of any kind, the budget is the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room as far as the legislature and the governor is concerned. How do budget problems impact what you want to see happen at the legislature? I mean, it's going to impact every aspect how does it impact environmental concerns? Well, it, it's, it's pretty devastating, actually. We, uh, when uh, uh, Governor Brewer took office uh, early on, she actually helped eliminate the Arizona Heritage Fund. This was a fund that had been in place since 1990, provided funding for parks and for uh, trails, historic preservation. Really a popular fund that benefited uh, pretty much every legislative district in the state. That's gone. We haven't been able to get that reestablished. Uh, we no longer have any state funding for conservation of land. Uh, they let the um, state trust land uh, funding expire, so there's no funding for that. Um, <clears throat> the Department of Environmental Quality is funded primarily by fees now. About 80, more than 80 percent of the agency is funded by permit fees. And uh, that provides an incentive for them to push those permits out and, and really means the people who are getting the permits are, are the ones driving the agenda more. And that's a real concern. Interesting. We ought to be protecting air and water with our general fund dollars, not just relying on permit fees. But again, as, as far as the state's economic woes, uh, the impact of that on your agenda, it's got to be pretty strong. And how do you get around that? How do you get the attention of lawmakers? When you say something like, let's increase money for this, find a sustainable funding source for that, and they're telling you we, we're already $500 million down. Well, they, they, uh, they do have to look at new funding programs. And uh, several years ago, in fact, right when Governor Brewer became governor, there were uh, recommendations on how to fund state parks. Uh, a fee at the time of registering your vehicle. It, you know, it could be um, something that if you uh, didn't want to do it, you could opt out, but uh, a fee like that. And, you know, it, I think most people, um, if they had a, you know, $10 fee when they registered their vehicle, it wouldn't be a huge hardship and it could help provide a lot of funding for state parks and, and mean that uh, we weren't letting them deteriorate and uh, have a backlog of costs for things that, if, if they're addressed early, earlier, are probably going to be cheaper. Last question here. What specifically, most importantly, will you be watching at the Capitol this session? Well, we'll, we'll be watching for more cuts and, and more weakening of programs. Uh, you know, we, we really feel like they um, have cut the agencies about as much as they can. And if we're going to see our environmental laws actually implemented, I mean, what you have on the books has to be implemented. 
then they need to make sure the funding is there. And Environmental Day at the Capitol, that's always a big wing. When is, when is that this that's, year? That's uh, January 22nd. It's a Thursday, and we already have about 100 people that are signed up to be there to talk to their lawmakers about how important environmental protection is to them. All right. Good to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank Thanks. you. Tonight's edition of Arizona Art Beat looks at a unique way to fund art projects. Arizona Art Tank makes strategic investments in arts-based ventures through seed money awarded to applicants who successfully pitch their ideas in regional competitions. Here now to explain all this is Robert Booker, Executive Director of the Arizona Commission on the Arts. Good to see you again. Great to be with you today. Let's talk about Arizona Art Tank. What in the heck are we talking about? Arizona Art Tank, think of Shark Tank. Um, Think of a competition where organizations come and pitch their best ideas. Uh, we wanted to help arts organizations across the state uh, really break the barrier that they'd been in before, kind of a barrier of, of business as usual trying to survive after the economic downturn. And so we created this program to really lift up those organizations and those ideas specifically uh, that are entrepreneurial, that are beyond the box, that help uh, provide access to our residents, provide ec economic development, all of the good things that the arts provide, but with a new twist on it, a new sort of uh, energetic uh, outlook. So these folks come to this, they had like four regional competitions around the state? Four regional competitions. This year we're in Flagstaff, we're in Bisbee, we're in Chandler, and we're in Peoria. Uh, there's a panel made up of local uh, arts leaders, entrepreneurs, business leaders, uh, legislators, uh, and each organization has six minutes to make their pitch. And uh, it is incredible to watch. Last year we had a lot of fun and a lot of success with organizations that, that really pitch their idea in an entrepreneurial, uh, creative way. Give us an example of an idea and give us an example of how that idea is pitched. One of my favorite one was uh, uh, Tumble Tees is a, a, a brand name of t-shirts uh, that is produced by an organization uh, called Tumber Weeds Center for Youth Development. This is a group that works with homeless teenage kids. They wanted to develop a program where they could earn revenue to support the work of the organization uh, and teach the kids skills. So they brought together uh, entrepreneurs, they brought together someone that understood small business, they brought an artist into the play, play. they brought a, a printmaker into the play, and someone that knows sales. And throughout the process, they have created a program where the kids actually design, print, and market a line of really pretty cool t-shirts. Now, what they did in their presentation, they had a great guy talking about, well, one, talking about being homeless and what that means to a kid, uh, a teenager. And then he talked about being with the center and meeting other kids. And then as he's talking, there's a guy in the background who is actually printing a T-shirt. Oh, okay. And so at the finale, at six minutes, yeah. they hold up the T-shirt. Uh, okay. and, and it was this sort of visual um, uh, representation of their goal. And uh, they were a, a very exciting, very positive group. Okay, and that's a winner. And yes. that winner gets seed money up to $10,000? Up to $10,000. That group um, got $10,000. And uh, it launched their program, which is now underway. And it's a program that, that not only uh, generates some revenue for the organization, but as I said, trains kids in small business, arts, production, printing. And where does the money come from? The money comes from uh, our budget at the Arizona Commission on the Arts. 
a year ago, two years ago actually, uh, for the last two years we've received funding uh, from the Rainy Day Fund. We received a million dollars from that fund and those dollars have gone into programs that provide access for Arizonans, specifically with a focus towards education and economic development. And we took some of those dollars out and created two brand new programs, this being one of them. We really wanted, we know that the arts community is innovative. We know that it's a creative community. Uh, but we really wanted to give them the opportunity to shine and really show off uh, how creative and how entrepreneurial they really are. Applications for 2015 for that particular art tank, is those, uh, those are closed, closed right? And art tanks are starting to happen. They will start to happen on January 12th. So if someone's watching it, though, and they're saying, all right, I got out, it didn't make it for 2015, let's try for 2016. What do they need to know? Where do they need to go? They can go to our website and get all the information about how to apply. Organizations apply with their idea. They're reviewed by a panel, and eight to ten organizations are chosen to actually give that presentation. Are there, are there organizations, are there ideas, ventures that are more appropriate than others? So who does well in these sorts of things? Well, I, anybody can do well. I, I think what's exciting is that it helps organizations also gain an ability to talk about their own mm -hmm. work to people that they maybe don't know. So we all talk about that elevator speech, that sort of need to express what you do in a short, short amount of time. It's one of those programs that builds that skill with organizations. It's also our hope that uh, we have a large audience. We have about 150 folks attending these events. Uh, this year we're sponsored by SR, uh, APS, and APS uh, will be giving out the uh, community awards. So that audience actually gets to vote for their favorite Art Tank competitor and they will get the APS Innovation Award. Um, so it, it, it is an exciting program and we're looking forward to it again. Uh, I mentioned Rainy Day Fund, that's how the original this thing got started. Yes. Uh, it, funding concerns with funding, this and other aspects? You bet, funding concerns uh, facing the economy uh, uh, has not quite recovered yet. So we're seeing our nonprofit arts organizations continue to struggle a bit, but actually they're doing pretty good. Uh, we're seeing them get back in the, in the play uh, expanding their programs for young people. Um, you know, we're a $500 million economic driver in the state, so we're an important element of the state's economy, we're an important element of the state's education. But this year is going to be tough at the legislature. We need, uh, at the very least, that million dollars to continue from any source, uh, and we're actually looking for a little bit larger. We're looking for a $2 million increase. That's been our official ask. Is that something that so far when you talk to, do they under, you talk about the $500 million engine, do they understand that or is that something that is over here and the budget is facing you right here? Well, I was excited. Uh, I was in a meeting uh, with uh, candidate Ducey uh, and he talked about the importance of the economic driver of the arts to Arizona. So as a businessman, he truly understands that the arts uh, provide economic incentive and provide economic resources. It was also nice to hear him talk about the value of arts education in our public schools, which is something we've talked about before. Uh, so to hear the governor understand and talk about uh, economic development through the arts and the importance of education in the lives of our K through 12 kids to me is an amazing sign as we move forward into this session. Last question, real quickly. Uh, they say sometimes during the worst of times you get the best of art. You notice any of that? Does that, does that ring true? Uh, that's the, uh, that's sort of the old starving, the old abused artist sort go. of yeah. theory. I don't know. I think, um, I think in the best of times and the worst of times, you get great art. Uh, it's a matter of, of growing those artists and keeping those artists in our state. All right. Well, good luck with the art tank this year. We're anxious to hear who won and who got the seed money. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you, sir. Good to see you.
Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading takes a behind the scenes look at the Phoenix Zoo. That's where producer Christina Estes and photographer Steve Aaron learned about a program that pairs teenagers with animals. I really love the zoo. I've been here since I was little and I love coming and seeing all the animals. These days, Anila Tynan does a lot more than just see the animals. So what we do in the morning is we might come in and you're gonna get all the poop out of the shavings and out of their stall. Anila is among more than 100 teens who volunteer at the Phoenix Zoo. It's really great to come, to be able to come on the weekend, to leave behind like school and the house and get here and just um, have fun with friends. I kind of view the zoo team program as a bridging program where they can bridge through their teen years into their adult life. Robin the Wilson runs carnivore. the program. You guys have any thoughts on that table and how we can make it better? Each volunteer begins as either a trail team where they present animal artifacts and share information with guests. What? Can goats run fast? Yeah, they can run fast. Yeah. Our goats are kind of lazy though, so. Or they can start as a farm team, which involves a lot of cleaning. As a second year volunteer, Anila was able to become an equine team. I really have a passion for horses. I really like working with them. I like being around them. And also, um, it's a great stepping stone to get to um, even higher levels of the Zoo Team program, like Animal Care Center, which is where you get to work alongside, hi, pretty girl, alongside the veterinarians. I haven't picked up poop at all, <laughs> believe it or not. Instead, Christian Topete picks up a lot of worms. He volunteers in the kitchen, where they scoop more than 44,000 mealworms every month. And our birds one string gets two cups of worms. It's probably the most amount that we distribute. As a member of the nutritional services team, Christian helps prepare 500 diets for 1,400 animals. So this, since this is my third year, I was able to apply for this. And I did the interview, and it scared me. <laughs> I was freaking out the whole time, but I finally made it. I got the call, and they told me that you know, they were going to accept me into the program. And I felt like I won the lottery, honestly. But this lottery winner still had to prove himself by taking a test on nutrition, personal hygiene, and food safety. So once I passed that, they asked me, you know, what, what's your experience with knives? And I, at the time, I had no experience with knives at all. Look at him now. Besides mastering knives, brooms, and rakes, zoo teens are exposed to networking, meetings, and even hiring decisions. I ran an interview um, alongside my supervisor and I got to see what it's like on the other side of the table. That's another huge key element to the Zoo Team program as I encourage the kids to develop relationships not just with myself but with the other uh, staff members here at the Phoenix Zoo so that they can get those letters of recommendation or a reference that they can um, have doors open for them. A whole world has opened for Christian since he took the first step as a 14-year-old trail team. It helped me grow as a person because I was really shy talking to people and I was not a good public speaker whatsoever. So, I mean, just fighting to get the words out was really hard for me, and now I'm comfortable with talking to any guest that comes up to me, and that helped me. Not every teen will spend their lives working at a zoo, <laughs> but everyone will remember their time as a zoo teen. The program is open to students 14 to 17 years of age. Applications are accepted from March through May. You can find more information at phoenixzoo.org. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, education advocates will tell us what they want to see from the legislature this session and learn how you can get certified as a Highlands naturalist. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.